Hello, I'm Caro Wilson of the Mill Road History Society and I'm going to give you a brief talk about the building that stands at the corner of Mill Road and Catherine Street in Romsey. I'm very grateful to Katie Blythe who did all the original research on the building. I do recommend you look up her full report on the website Capturing Cambridge. You can find the link here and on the last slide. The building is now two separate businesses. 175A is Hillary's The Greengrocers and 175B is Cut Price Carpets. Rarely, when shopping, do we remember to look further than the shop window. But if you do now look up, you'll be able to see that the two shops clearly inhabit one building and that although the building has clearly been modernised, there are enough clues for you to be able to deduce that it was built in the 19th century. Look, for instance, at that lovely line of brick coursing running right around the building and at the high roof and the arch on the Catherine Street side. This is one of our favourite maps of the Mill Road area. It dates from 1886, though this coloured version was issued in 1888. You can see how rapidly Romsey is developing, although the railway still has no road bridge. The lodge is standing in its extensive grounds, where the Broadway is now, and there is little development beyond Hope Street on the southern side of the road. The site we are interested in is still vacant. There were already three grocer's shops in Romsey at this time, but clearly George Ivert, the owner of the Unicorn Trading Company, thought that this thriving road opened up an opportunity for him. This photograph actually dates from the 1950s, but probably the original building looked very much like this. The Unicorn Trading Company, which was started by the Ivert family of Cottenham, specialised in corn and seed, bakery, vegetables and beer. The hoist you can see on the right hand side of the building would have been used for hauling up sacks of produce from the horses and carts which came from the family farm. The building at that time had both a full length loft and a full length cellar, together with extensive outbuildings at the back. The two front doors and the two sets of steps are puzzling. Was one door perhaps for the staff and one for the customers? Frank Waters, the architect named here, had a very high reputation in Cambridge. He is best known now for the handsome old library in Mill Road and for the bridge over the river in Victoria Street. Clearly, the Ivert family believed in the power of advertising. Their notices appeared regularly in the Cambridge Daily newspapers. Do note in particular, at the bottom right, the notice about the bridge opening. There had been a footbridge over the railway track since 1879, but now, for the first time, the crossing gates, with their frequent frustrating delays, would be gone forever, and horses and carts, gentry in their carriages, and cowmen with their cattle could all pass easily from Romsey to Petersfield and back again. This feels rather ironic now that Mill Road Bridge has been closed to all traffic other than pedestrians and cyclists as a result of emergency COVID legislation. The roads, however, were still not metalled, as this first story from 1889 shows. The newspaper has headlined it, The Danger of Bad Roads. Because the road was so rough, the employee of the shop was unable to control his pony and cart. When the pony bolted, he was thrown from the cart and his thigh broken when the wheel went over him. In the second story, the three boys were up to no good. But theirs is such a spirited story with such a lot of period detail that I can't resist reading the whole thing. So bear with me. It is rare in historical research to hear a child's voice like this. Yesterday, myself, brother Robert and William Taylor, instead of going to school, we decided to break into the Uni Unicorn Trading Company's shop in Mill Road. 
We played in the fields in St Philip's Road till it was dark. About seven, we went into a butcher's shop, corner of St Philip's Road. The shop was locked up. We pulled the cellar grate up, went into the back room attached to the shop and lighted a fire. We got some meat, and we cooked it and ate it. We stopped there until about 12 o'clock. I took a knife. We then went to the unicorn shop in Mill Road. Mr. Searle is the manager and we knew he lived in Catherine Street and that no one slept in the shop. The cellar grate was off. We all got down into the cellar and found the door was fastened. So we went to the back of the shop and all of us picked the putty out of the frame of one pane, which we removed and entered the shop. We knew the money was in a little drawer in a little office which had no door to it. The drawer wasn't locked. I opened it and we took the money. There was no gold, but there was a lot of silver and some coppers, including a lot of farthings. We took the silver and some of the copper and we found Banbury cakes on the counter and we had one each. We had no light, but as the moon was shining brightly, we could see very well without. We stopped there about 10 minutes. Then we went back to the butcher's shop and stopped there for about a quarter of an hour. And then we went to the ballast hole on the Great Eastern Railway and got into a first class carriage and stayed there until seven o'clock. We went to sleep there. We then walked to Harston and arrived about 9.30 and booked to London. We paid two shillings, tuppence, halfpenny each for our tickets. We got to London about 12 o'clock. We went to a coffee shop. We had some coffee and bread and butter. I spent four pence, Robert spent four pence and Taylor five pence. We each had some coffee and bread and butter. We bought a cap each for which we paid sixpence halfpenny. We went to a shoe shop and bought a pair of boots each for which we paid five and six. I bought half a pound of chocolate for threepence and the other two had a tuppenny cake each. We then decided not to stop in London. Robert and myself decided to go to Yarmouth to see if we could see the sea there and Taylor said he'd go home again. We got to Holloway Station and we took tickets accordingly. I paid ten shillings for mine and Robert five shillings for his and Taylor two shillings threepence halfpenny. We travelled to Finsbury Park Station where we changed and while we went to the platform waiting for the train to take us on that gentleman, pointing, came and questioned us and I told we'd taken some money from our fathers and that we'd run away. The story did not end happily for the boys. They were sentenced to jail for 14 days and then sent to a reformatory for five years. George Ivert went bankrupt in 1894. We don't know why. The building was probably divided into two at this time as there seems to have been a beer retailer and a furniture dealer in part of the premises. What we know for sure is that in about 1895, the corner shop was run by George French, who also owned another shop in East Road. As well as corn and flour, he sold animal feed, garden seeds and fruit and vegetables. People have happy memories of his shop. Here's a Mrs Finch. Very vivid in my mind was a corn merchant's situated at the corner of Catherine Street. To enter the shop you had several steps, but oh the joy of entering to buy a halfpenny worth of horse beans or tiger nuts. Horse beans and tiger nuts were sold as animal food, but humans can eat them too and they now are a very expensive vegan snack. Here's a Mrs Barraclough. I remember the steps up the front. I used to run up and down them. We used to get all our flour from there. There were always sacks outside. I remember Mr. French, a very nice man. He used to go out to the back of the shop to get stuff. There was a long counter inside. Mr. Forsdyke remembers watching the bags of grain being taken up by the hoist to the loft above, and he's sorry that the hoist has gone now. My father used to get his oats and bran and pollard for his rabbit and chickens there. At the beginning of the last century, one Frederick Dale seems to have shared the premises with George French. 
he would go on to develop his brewery business until he was able to establish himself in the familiar handsome building in Guider Street, which is still called Dale's Brewery. There is evidence that at one time he owned the whole of number 175. After French sold the shop in 1909, the business changed hands several times and was substantially altered in the early 1960s by the then owner, J.W. Christensen. The lovely bottom photograph may show a Mrs. Jean Heiner from the 1960s who owned or managed the shop at that time. 175 was variously a radio sale and repair shop and upholsterers and printers before becoming in 1988 or 1989 coral bookmakers. And here is the opening of the bookmakers. After his days as first a racehorse and then a stud stallion, Red Rum embarked on a third career of helping to inaugurate booking shops. And here he is both inside and outside the shop. I have to say that that photograph at the top is one of my very favourite photographs of Mill Road. Do take a closer look at this lovely building when you are in Romsey. I thank Katie Blythe for her kind permission to allow for the use of her building report. And I do urge you to read the original, which can be found by following the link here. If you would like to be kept informed about what's happening for the Mill Road History Society, do sign up to our free newsletter. The link is shown here.